If you would, turn this morning to Philippians chapter, we'll turn to chapter 3. So we're going back to our study in Philippians. We've taken a break here for a few weeks as we went through the holidays, and I pray that your holidays were blessed. But here we come into the new year today, this first Sunday in 2019. We've returned to Philippians, and, and uh, if you ever think that there's a whole lot of planning that goes into where we're at specifically within the Word, certainly I pray about what book we go into, but we don't do a whole lot in terms of this Sunday and this Sunday. We, we go as the Spirit leads, and, and I couldn't be more pleased personally with the fact that here, as we enter into this new year, that we're in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to really cover uh, in... in Okay, hold your breath on this one. We're going to cover three and four today, but we're going to do it a little bit differently uh, throughout this week. And sometimes this is the way the Lord works. Sometimes you, you, have, you prepare specifically for something, and the Lord begins to sort of change that. Uh, and it was this morning that, that I was sitting here reviewing our passage, and listen, I had a, what I felt like was a pretty good three-point sermon on Philippians chapter 4 prepared. And, and now I get to file that away maybe and use it as a, at another time. We get in the sound taken care of here. We good? We're good now. Does that sound better? All right. Sounds better to me, too. Um, and so as, as I was uh, preparing again this morning, uh, I just sensed a little bit of uh, a nudge to kind of change things for us today. And so, and, and, and what I mean by that here is, so, you know, if, listen, if you're looking for, here's the, here's the three things that we see in chapter four today, that's not what you're going to get. What I think we have for us here today, I think what the Holy Spirit desires of us this morning is to consider chapters 3 and 4 together because that's really, this is how the, the Apostle Paul gave it to the church in Philippi and it's those two chapters that I believe give us a great pattern for the Christian life. And, and it, it would do us well to consider these two in conjunction with one another because they start at a particular place and lead to a particular place that I believe, and it's certainly my prayer not only for myself, but all of you, uh, that it would be a place where we would all find ourselves at throughout this year. And that is a place of godly contentment. That is a place of understanding and knowing the will of God, knowing God more intimately than perhaps ever before, and being at a place where regardless of what may be going on in your life, you find yourself oddly at peace and saying, I am content. I am at a place where I am just enjoying fellowship with the Lord. This time of year, inevitably, I think we all, and maybe we take different approaches to it, but we all evaluate the year that we just had. And we think about the year that we're going into. And some of you, you may make New Year's resolutions. Some of you may just reflect. You may set some goals. You don't want to call them resolutions. We do a lot of different things. But I think we all know that generally speaking in our culture, the resolutions that are made are not too often kept. In fact, it was somewhat funny on social media throughout this week. I read it in an article how many people posted as quickly as 12.01 a.m. that they had broken their resolution for the year. <laughs> and and, and, and that's, that's so common, right? It is common. And it's not to suggest that making goals for our year isn't a good thing. It's not to suggest that trying to... Uh, use less technology or frequent the gym more to do different things that would better our, our well-being, our circumstances are necessarily a bad thing. But they all pale in comparison to knowing Christ more. And that's ultimately what the Apostle Paul was communicating here to this church in Philippi, this church, this group of believers whom he loved dearly. He loved this church. We see it clearly in the words that he wrote. And while he didn't necessarily address a whole lot of uh, issues within the church, we'll see today here in chapter 4 that there is an issue that he does address, but there wasn't some great problem going on within the church in Philippi. However, this letter, often referred to, and you've heard it, the epistle of joy, does address that specific thing within the church in Philippi because they were struggling a little bit, I believe, with joy in their lives. They were struggling a little bit with rejoicing in the Lord because of some things that had begun to happen within the church. And so throughout the letter, and here again in 3 and 4, Paul is encouraging them, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. He says it over and over again. Why? Well, because 
because of certain things, they had begun to lose some of that joy. And Paul didn't want to see that happen. And here for us, as we consider the year before us, as we move forward into this year, I want this to be a year filled with joy. I want us to rejoice together in the year ahead. And, and, and rest assured, there will be difficult times. You may be having a difficult day today. It doesn't mean that circumstances are going to be perfect, yet in the midst of those difficult circumstances, despite those difficult circumstances, we can be a people, we ought to be a people, who have joy. We ought to be a people who, as Paul says in verse 11 of chapter 4, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Do you want that? Do you want that kind of contentment? If you ask yourself today, are you content in that way? Do you have a godly contentment? You may uh, right away say, no, I, I know that I don't. I'm a very discontented person. Or you may be inclined to very quickly say, oh, yeah, I'm content. I don't struggle with a desire or a need for material things. And, and, and that may, may very well be the case. But I challenge you to allow the Lord to search your heart, especially today as we prepare our hearts for communion, to say, okay, am I really content? Am I really content? Or do I find myself continually seeking after all sorts of different things that I think or I believe or I hope are going to bring me to a place where I have more joy? And the reality is, if it's anything other than Christ, it's going to fail. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that we were not made for this world. Do you have a desire that this world just can't seem to satisfy? If so, praise God. Praise God for that. But my challenge to you would be not to, to take that desire and allow it to be turned into some sort of hole that you just spend yourself constantly seeking after and, and, and failing to fill it, but rather to say, that's that desire for Christ alone. That's that desire that's going to keep me thirsting for more and more and more of him. As Paul said at the end of, of, of chapter 3, uh, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 20. That's what that desire should prompt us to. But here we have this man, and he was indeed a man. It's the Apostle Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he penned this letter, but a man just like us. And so as we see here, this man who's writing a letter to a church that he loves, who he loved very dearly, and he's trying to remind them to be joyful as he writes this letter as he's sitting in prison awaiting his death. Isn't that an odd thing? That it would be him who would have to remind them of, of, of what they can rejoice in? And I look at this and I say to myself, I want that too. And I, not only do I want that for myself, I want it for all of you. I want for this body to be able to see us. We have such a godly contentment that we rejoice in the Lord, that we have joy that's unspeakable, that we have joy, we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense, but it's, it's found in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Amen. And so let's consider then, as Paul says here at the beginning of chapter 3, in verse 1, as he says, Finally, my brethren, and he begins to take them on this journey of how their life should look, the pattern that they should follow that they might enjoy this contentment. And so as we look there, if you would, just agree with me in prayer once more. Father, as we look to your word here now in these two chapters, Lord, there's so much here. And so, Lord, I pray that today, Lord, that you would help us to just take in what you have here for us that we would apply it to our lives, that we would have understanding of it, and that we leave this place today, Lord, encouraged, transformed, and we're ready in this new year to seek and to follow after you with more fervency, Lord, with more passion than ever before, Lord, I pray. So Lord, do this work here this morning, if I might ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
So in chapter 3 here at the beginning, again, we, we, and, and we've been through chapter 3 before. Those of you who were with us, if you, if you weren't here, you can go back and listen to the study. We'll move through chapter 3 a bit more quickly here. And what we see here at the beginning of chapter 3 is that the Apostle Paul is beginning to uh, deal with something here that he's had to deal with with other churches in other areas. And what he's dealing with are those who are seeking to bring God's people back into a place of legalism, of works-based salvation. And so he's addressing that here at the beginning as he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He says, we are the people who do this. We are the people of the true circumcision. This isn't about a physical act. This is about a spiritual act. He says, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about what you bring to the table. It's not about what you've earned. It's not about what you've worked for. It's not about your resume. And so as we go through this here this morning, I'm praying, and I have no doubt, that each and every person here, that there is something in these two chapters that should strike you. There is something that, that through these two chapters, you might say, that's me. If you're honest with yourself, I know that's me. And I believe the Lord wants to deal with that today. And it's not just about you, it's about me too. And, and for me, I feel like it was everything. <laughs> and for me, I, I, I left my study of Philippians saying, I need to memorize these two chapters. And just be reminded of it on a regular basis. But, but here, Paul is addressing the fact that they were beginning to have confidence in their flesh. He says, verse 4, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So here, Paul was reminding them, in, in not so arrogant of a way, do you know who I am? Listen, I'm telling you, if you want to have confidence in the flesh, that I could have the most. Paul as he says here in verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. That, that, was, that means that it was done exactly how it was supposed to be done at the right time. It was perfect. It was according to the law. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He says, listen, by man's standard, I had it all, I'd accomplished it all, I was at the top of the org chart, if you will. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. What Paul says here, and those of you that were with us for that study, you know, what does he say about his past? What does he say about his resume? What does he say about his accomplishments? He says they're rubbish. Is rubbish really rubbish? It was excrement. That's the more literal translation. It was waste. That's what he says of his resume. That's what he says of his accomplishments. It's, it's worthless compared to knowing Jesus Christ. He says, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. And so the first thing we need to recognize here this morning, two groups of people. One, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to hear loud and clear that it doesn't require anything on your part other than faith. You don't have to work to earn it. You don't have to get to some place in your life where now you're ready. You don't have to bring some sort of offering other than yourself to say, Lord, here I am. You can't earn salvation. It is a free gift to you. Do you hear that? It's a free gift. And the other group would be those who are saved, but yet you've somehow convinced yourself that you've got to continue to work to earn it. 
and that you somehow made it. Maybe it's this past year, maybe it's the year ahead, but you convinced yourself that you've got to do all of these things so that you can get in right standing with God or so that you can earn salvation, so that you can earn his favor, so that you can pay the price for your sins. He paid them for you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happens when we do that? In Galatians chapter 2, if you turn back just a few pages, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Do you know that today? Are you aware of that today? That if, if, if it's about you and your righteousness and what you need to work for and what you need to earn, then you make Christ's death vain. Because the death that he died, like he paid the price through that. He paid the price. And so we can come to him freely. And so here Paul says back in Philippians chapter 3, he says, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, verse 10 and 11, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And this was the goal. This was the goal here, that he would know him. And so your aim, our aim for this year ahead ought to be that we would know him more. And not as a result of our efforts, not as a result of our works or our unrighteousness, but because he died for us. That through faith we might know him. And not just to know him, and not just to know the power of his resurrection, but also the fellowship of his sufferings. To be conformed to his death. Just as Paul was saying there in the letter to the Galatians that, that, that he was dead and alive in Christ. And if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Continuing on in verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And so here he says, I'm, I'm pressing on. He says, I haven't already attained these things. This is a process of sanctification. Okay, this is an ongoing process of knowing him more and knowing him more. And he says, I haven't arrived here yet. So I press on. Is this year for you about pressing on, about moving forward, about knowing him more? He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do and we should, we should pay attention to this. When, when someone's saying within the word of God, when the apostle says, one thing I do, we should, we should want to know what's that one thing. What is it that he's doing here? And how appropriate here at, at the beginning of this new year, he says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. There may have been a lot that happened in 2018, a lot that happened this last year. And there may be a lot of it that you want to hang on to, whether because it was an accomplishment and you think somehow now you've, you've, you've earned something, that you've arrived because you achieved something, or maybe it's something that's, that the enemy wants to use to hold you back, to not let you forget about some failure, some sin in your life that, you, that he's going to use to keep you stuck there. Whatever it is, put it behind you. It's time to move forward. It's time... To forget those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. In verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so, yes, now he is using language here that speaks of action that, that we should recognize requires effort on someone's part. But not an effort to earn salvation, not an effort to earn righteousness, but in light of everything that God has done to simply say, I want more of that. I want to pursue you, Lord. If there's anything I'm going to put effort and energy into this year, it's going to be to know you more. It's going to be to come to a place where I have a greater intimacy with you, Lord, than I've ever had before. And so we should put our effort and energy into that for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. 
And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. And so he says here, listen, if you're mature, then we should have the same mind. That as, as a, a fellowship, as a body of believers, we should all have this same mind. That our ultimate goal, our aim, should be to press forward, should be to press on, should be to pursue him more. Some of you have, have been praying for and, and asking about where are we going in the year ahead, what's the, uh, the uh, direction of the church going to be, what are the things we're going to invest in, and, and, and quite frankly, we don't know all those answers. So we, we go through an exercise of evaluating the previous year and, and going, what, what things worked really well, what what things were enjoyable for the body? What things just didn't go so well? And, and so certainly there's an exercise there to say, well, let's do that again. Let's invest in that same thing again. Certainly there's a, an effort to continue to support missions, to grow our missions outreach and support. But in, in, in all of it, it's looked at through the lens of, does this prompt us to pursue him more? Does this allow for us to have the same mind, to be about pressing on, pursuing him more, knowing him more? We ought to have that same mind. In verse 17, Paul says, brethren, join in following my example. And so here he says, follow me, do what I'm doing. Paul had enough confidence, and this wasn't arrogance. This was, this was him being led of the Spirit, knowing that he had been a good example and saying, follow my example. And note those who so walk, as you have for us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. He is recognizing here those individuals who profess to be believers, and we could debate whether or not he's recognizing those who are believers, but who have gone astray, or who, who just simply say they're believers. And, and that would be less of a relevant point for us. More importantly for us to look at here is these are people who use the grace of God to their advantage, who indulge in the things of this world, who continue to put their trust in the things of this world, who want to enjoy the things of this world over the things of Christ. They follow after their own desires, their own appetites. And he says, he tells them here, even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. They set their mind on earthly things. Christian, what are you setting your mind on today? Paul's going to hit on this again. What are you focused on? What are you setting your mind on? What are the things that you are allowing to come in on a regular basis, to come into your mind and into your heart? Paul says here in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. What he wants us to understand, what he wanted this church to understand here, is they, and remember, what was unique about this church in Philippi? They were Roman citizens. Okay, they were a very unique city that had been given Roman citizenship, all the benefits associated with it, primarily because of how they had received the Roman army into their city when they invaded and because they were so kind, because they were so receiving, because they were so uh, uh, hospitable that they were assumed into the Roman Empire and given all the benefits of citizenship. And so we have to understand that here as he's telling them, your citizenship is in heaven. And I can't help but read that and think about us living here in America and somehow thinking we are something because we're Americans. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's okay for us to have a sense of pride in terms of what our country has accomplished over these few hundred years. It's okay for us to have a sense of, of you know, hey, we, we, are, we are a great country and we should be, be happy about the freedoms that we have. But we far too often make the mistake of, of placing our citizenship at some place higher than our faith and our belief in God and, and recognizing that that's who we are especially as our country is so tumultuous as so many things are happening around us that, that, of course, what might strike fear in the heart might cause us to go, what is going on? We, we should be remembering more so and more so that our citizenship is in heaven. And because of that, Christian, knowing that you're not home, just like the C.S. Lewis quote, that you weren't made for this world, he says, then from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Is that you today? Are you eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus? Does that have a, a significant place in your mind and your heart where on a regular basis you say, I am so excited for his return. For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some accuse, you of, some accuse us of, of when we have that mentality of just wanting to escape all of this. And I say, amen. I absolutely want to escape all of this. Do I want people to perish forever in, in, in hell? No, not at all. And so I, I want to be faithful in sharing my faith. But rest assured, when he returns, it's on his time. He knows when he's going to return, and it's going to be absolutely right. It's going to be absolutely perfect, and it is not wrong in any way, shape, or form for me to say, I can't wait for that time. I'm longing for it. Who will transform, verse 21, our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Don't you want that? According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And now, so here, look what he says to this church. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. He loved them dearly. My joy and crown. He considered this is a uh, this is a Stephanos crown. This is a prize that's that's given to the victor. This is for him. He looked at this church and he said, "Man, I am proud of that church." He says, "Stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Stand fast." And that and that ought to be a, another sort of rally cry for us in this year. A battle cry for us to say, stand fast in the Lord. That ought to be something we encourage one another with. As we do go through trying times in the year ahead, from Christian brothers and sisters saying to others, stand fast. Stand fast. And here he says, and this, he begins to then talk about the unity that should exist within the church. As he says in verse 2, I implore Odia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now we need to pause here, and, and this may seem a little out of place, because as Paul has been talking sort of about the Christian faith in general, and, and circumstances certainly related to the church in Philippi, here this is a little different, because now he's addressing a very specific circumstance, and he's calling them out by name. You see, Paul didn't have any issue in this letter saying, hey, you two, get it together, right? Think of if, if, if all of a sudden you know, we started to come here, this is sort of the equivalent of a Sunday morning and me standing up here in front of you and saying, hey, you and you, let's figure this out right now, okay? <laughs> James and Carl. <laughs> this isn't good. Right. Odia and Syntyche here I mean you can imagine who is, is this is being read somebody in the audience is saying oh. <laughs> got it now I knew this was coming okay but why 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 was Paul addressing this because there was division within the church. There was division amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. This was specifically here, two women. And he says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also. So now Clement's like, don't bring me into this. I wanted to stay out of this. But he says, Clement, I need you to help here also. And the rest of my fellow workers, look, whose names are in the book of life. How do we view the church how do we view our brothers and sisters in Christ? What we need to recognize here is even when there's disagreements, even when there's issues, even when there's things that certainly the enemy would seek to use to divide us, we have to recognize we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Our names are all in the book of life. We're going to be in eternity together forever. So maybe we should start practicing what that looks like and not letting these little things divide us. And it's not just about that, but, but Paul's going to explain why this was impacting them. And here, what's his response to this? What's his solution for it? Did Paul come in and give them some uh, great lengthy counseling to try and understand what was going on and where the conflict began and let's deal with the root cause? I'm not suggesting that's always a bad thing to go, but here Paul's solution, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
How did he begin the, the, the third chapter? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. You see that Paul is encouraging them, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Are you rejoicing in the Lord in this way? Do you have joy today, Christian? Do you have joy? It is not my intent to be condemning if you lack joy. But if you do, your focus is misplaced. Your heart is out of alignment. You're lacking intimacy with him. It does not say here that we need to rejoice in our circumstances, okay? Paul's not saying here you need to, oh, fantastic, I lost my job. I can't pay my bills. I can't do this, I can't do it. I'm sick again, woohoo! It's not what he's saying here. But he's saying, despite any of those things, are you aware of the fact that you are deserving of death? Of eternal punishment? That he paid the price for your sins? Such truth should rise above all of those other circumstances to where we truly can rejoice in the Lord always. It is almost the equivalent, and see, this may sound silly to us. It may seem somewhat foreign to us, but if there's an issue between you and another brother that you could essentially approach them, and, and with smiles you could say, we're saved. We're saved. We know the Lord. I love you, brother. We're going to be together for eternity. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You'll be different then. Yes, we all will be different. Praise God that we don't have to bring this stinky flesh into eternity with us. But it doesn't change the truth of what awaits us. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He wants us to understand that we ought to be filled with joy, that we should regularly be rejoicing. And listen, part of our worship, this is about part of our worship. As we serve the Lord, we should do so with joy. We should do so rejoicing. The Lord cares about that. He says, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. This could also be translated graciousness. This is essentially that we should be a picture of Christ, a picture of the gospel for the world. They should see within us something that they don't encounter elsewhere in their lives. In, in terms of unbelievers, they should look at the church and go, wow. It's a people that just loves one another. What an example. Yet there's a, there's a movement that exists today. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and, and it's about, it's essentially called empty the pews. It, it's, it's, it's a social media movement where people are sharing their stories of hurt in the church and encouraging one another to leave the church. And the unfortunate thing about it is I read some of these accounts as I look at them and I say, yeah, they, they have a right to be hurt. There's no doubt about that. The problem is, is, is they're just the solution to them is, well, let's just leave it. Forget about it. Let's, can, let, let, let's, let, let's cause everybody to just run from the church. And that wouldn't happen if the church were rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If they were letting their graciousness be known to all men. If we, in our conflicts with one another, were quick to say, let's move past this. This is silly. Now, it doesn't mean either that we just get the freedom to just hurt people and say, well, you should just forget about it. No, we need to be, sen we need to be sensitive. We need to be in tune. We need to be at peace with one another pursuing that. When, when it's appropriate to say, I'm sorry, say you're sorry. But we should make that happen quickly so that we can experience what Paul is communicating here. He goes on to say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You might have memorized that verse. Philippians chapter 4 is full of these memorization verses. As he says here, be anxious for nothing. What does anxiety, what does anxiousness, what does worry do for you? What does it accomplish? Nothing. It's a fear for the future about something that hasn't happened. You are literally worrying about nothing. Now, there may be real circumstances in your life causing you to think, well, this could happen, but the reality is it hasn't. Yet you're anxious about it. I think it's Proverbs 12, 5 that says a, 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 an anxious heart is a heavy burden. Do you know that? And so is this you? Are you one who deals with worry and anxiety? 
I'm here to tell you today that it is a sin. And the word is very clear what you're to do. To be anxious for nothing but what? Just forget about it? No. Pray about it. Bring it to the Lord. With prayer and supplication, prayer can be, is almost a general term that can be uh, used to encompass all of our communication with God. And then in supplication, it can be about making very specific requests to the Lord. Lord, Lord, I have a need in my life. And I need help. Lord, I'm struggling with this. Lord, I'm asking that you would take care of this issue. Do you know how freeing it is sometimes, too, when there's an issue that needs to be dealt with? And, and you can just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do in this situation. And I'm asking, Lord, that you would take care of this. To pray Proverbs 3, 5, and 7, to trust to the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but into all your ways, acknowledge him, and for him to make straight your paths. To say, Lord, I've screwed this up. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this, but I know you do. And I am trusting in you, Lord. Will you straight, make straight my path? anxious for nothing. And it says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what happens when you do this? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We all want that peace, don't we? Do you want that peace? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. But a lot of times we just want the peace. We don't want to consider what comes before it. How does that peace come? Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I say, rejoice, pray, seek Him, everything, all things. It says all things. It didn't say rejoice in the Lord sometimes. It didn't say pray about a few things. Rejoice in the Lord always, in all things. Pray. And as you do that, that peace, which surpasses all understanding, it means, it doesn't mean it's, it, it, it's, it's silly, it means it's, it, you don't get it. You can't quite explain it. And it becomes a wonderful testimony to other people. Right? As, as they see you in the midst of, of, of crisis, but yet you're at peace. And you say, I can't explain it. But I'm at peace. It's okay. I know God has got this taken care of. He's guarding your heart and your mind. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Once again, Paul is saying, follow my example. I taught you this. I showed you this. I lived this out for you. Do these things. But he's saying here, and he's saying to all of us through the Spirit here, what are you looking at? What are you spending your time on? What are you listening to? What are you, what's the major influence in your life? Are you someone here today? You need to press your panic button. <laughs> We got it. Good job. It's okay. What are you focused on? What are you allowing in? What's the major influence in your life? Be honest with yourself here. Do the math. Think of where you spend your time throughout the course of the week. How much of what is pure, lovely, of good report, of virtue, praiseworthy, how much of that is making its way into your heart and your mind? Do you find yourself spending endless hours watching things on TV that you know you probably shouldn't watch? And I'm not just suggesting it's the late night stuff. I'm saying anything because there's very few things on TV that's worthy of your time. How much of it? If that's an issue for you, cancel the cable. Right? Make it known and ask people to pray for you about that, that your cable would go out and you'd have no way to ever restore it again. The, the video games, where you work, where you go after work, who you spend time with, all of it, guys. We, we, there are certain things that it, it seems sometimes we just have to do. We have to work through it. Work can be one of those things, right? So what are you doing with the rest of your time? What's your drive look like to and from work? What are you listening to in that time? Are you taking advantage of every possible moment to fill your heart and your mind with things that are virtuous, with things that are pure, with, th with, things, with things that are lovely? 
Is this you today? Do you need to focus on meditating more on these things? These things can, in fact, transform your mind. Finally, in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now here, what he's saying here is not that I'm glad you're finally giving me some things again, but no, he's saying, remember, Paul was on a journey. Paul, he was shipwrecked. He went through a lot of different things before he arrived, and the Philippian church was greatly desiring to serve him, to minister to him, to send things to him, but they didn't have the opportunity to do so, and now they do, and what Paul's going to focus on here a little bit for them is the importance of giving. He's going to encourage them that giving is a good thing. And so he's glad that they're able to minister to him. But he doesn't want them to think that this is him asking for more. For he says in verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of you have misused that verse? Go ahead and look at my, not that you can find it, but uh, my senior year yearbook. We had to enter into a little bio about you know, the seniors. Here, tell us about yourself and give us a quote. Well, in true transparency, I was a carnal Christian at that point in my life. And I thought it my duty to really you know, put a verse in there that's really going to speak to people. And I'd like Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because an athlete, of course, that's the verse we want over all of our locker rooms, right? We can do this. And so we oftentimes quote that verse as like, yeah, I've got Christ in me. I can jump off this building and land on my feet. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Foolish. Once again, we take verses out of context. Little did I even consider the fact that what that was saying here was, yeah, I can suffer for the Lord and be content with it. Because that's ultimately what he's talking about here when he says this. But here's the point. As Paul works his way through all of this, he comes to this point where we see a man who's sitting in prison. He says, I'm content. I'm content. Do you need that kind of contentment? Listen, I can stand before you today and tell you that certainly there are times when it can be material things that I desire, but that's less the issue here when it comes to contentment. But I can certainly tell you that there's a lot of other areas in my life where I'm far from content. And I spend a whole lot of time and energy chasing after things that will not fulfill, that will, that will not accomplish the thing that I think it's going to accomplish. And these can be good things things. This, these things can be ministry. They can be things that we think are in pursuit of the Lord. Is that you today? Do you need that kind of contentment? We're going to start to close here. I want you to consider here. I know we're running short of time. Look real quick at uh, Genesis 29. privilege of participating in a Bible study earlier this week. And the gentleman touched on a few different aspects of Genesis 29. But one that stood out in particular to me as it relates to this very issue was regarding Leah, Laban's oldest daughter, <coughs> who was in deceit given to Jacob as his wife, unlike Rachel, which was the plan. And as I considered this particular passage, what we considered here, and there's so much, this is, trust me, we will be in Genesis at some point, because that's where I'm spending time reading right now in my, just my personal time. I'm like, oh, Lord, let's go. This is good. But in this particular passage here, listen, Leah was the eldest daughter. And we don't have to go into a ton of detail here, but the reality is there was something about Leah's physical appearance that made her less desirable. And as the eldest daughter, it was unlikely that she would ever be married off. And here came Jacob into town, and he had eyes for Rachel right away. And for Laban, he had no doubt that Rachel would be married off at some point. But Leah, on the other hand, how was he going to get rid of her? 
And I can't imagine even in that moment and throughout Leah's life how that very reality for her and that no doubt relationship that suffered with her own father, the condemnation that came upon her as a result of that and the hole that existed in her heart for love and for acceptance and a desire to feel valued. And so here, no doubt, she didn't want to be sent into this tent under the cover of, of night to deceive uh, Jacob. I doubt that she wanted to be party to this plan. But there was perhaps within her heart maybe a little bit of hope that in the morning when they'd wake and Jacob would see her, that he would think, yeah, I, I do want you as my wife. But he didn't. We know the, the account tells us very clearly that he very much felt deceived and wondered why this thing had been done to him. Nevertheless, the Lord's blessing came upon Leah and she was able to give birth to a son. And we have in Scripture in Genesis 29 and verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And consider Leah here as this, this name Reuben in, in the Hebrew essentially sounds like, See, here's a son. Look, look what I've, look what the Lord has done for me here. Maybe now you'll love me. Maybe now you'll accept me. Maybe now this thing that I've been trying to to figure out how to fill this hole in my heart with. Maybe this will work now. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said in verse 33, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, and so we know that it didn't work. This desire of hers did not result in what she was hoping for. He still didn't love her. And so here she has another son, and, 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 and the Lord had heard her cry because she was unloved, and he has therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Three times now. Pursuing, thinking, maybe, maybe now this will fill the void. Maybe now this will bring that contentment that I've longed for. Maybe now I'll be loved the way that I desire to be loved. Yet it still didn't fulfill. And she conceived again in verse 35 and bore a son. And said, now I will praise the Lord. Amen. Therefore she called his name Judah. And she stopped bearing. Some of your translations may read, this time, I will praise the Lord. And it was Judah. From whom the line of Jesus would come. It was this time that she said, we get the sense here. I'm not worried about his validation, his affirmation, his love. I'm not worried about filling my heart, the void that exists in my heart with all of these other things. No, this time, this time I'll praise the Lord. See, Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And this is something he says he learned it. It came over time. In verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And so here Paul was simply saying, listen, give, because it will bear much fruit. He's not saying I need it. He's not saying I want you to, 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 to give me more. He's saying... It, it will bear fruit in your lives. And listen, this can be used uh, in a good way. It can be used in a bad way. Some people, you can use this to say, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to give so that I can receive. Okay, that's not right. But I will tell you, this principle very much exists, that if you give, the Lord will supply your need. 
And listen, this isn't about me saying I need you to tithe. This isn't, I'm not going to wrap things up here with the tithe message. I would want you to know, as I always let you know, I don't know who tithes. I can look at each and every one of you in the eye, and I can tell you I have no idea whether or not you give. I never see it. I don't want to know it. I, I don't want to know. I don't, I'm not a part of the process. I don't count the money. Okay, I don't do any of that. But I can tell you here, give, because you will be blessed in it. And if you're someone today who, and you're not giving because you perceive that you can't because you have these other needs, if you start to give, I feel very confident the scripture says he will begin to take care of those needs. You'll hear in our annual meeting at the end of this month what we've been able to do this year as a church in terms of the giving. We far surpassed what we had even planned and anticipated from missions. Far surpassed it because we said, just keep giving. Let's give more. The Lord's brought some in. Let's give it away. Let's go. Let's keep giving. And the Lord continues to bless it. And he wanted them to experience that same fruit. Indeed, I have all, verse 18, and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God, listen, shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Do you see the pattern that Paul puts before us here? It may seem like a lot there, but the reality is, is this is just a pattern. This is a process. Folks, that happens as you seek to know him more as you seek to live for him.